Pastor Jim was talking, and, uh, you know, he talked about if if the president would 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 use his army to wipe out anyone that would accuse him of taking those funds. You know where my mind went? My mind went to North Korea. And, and the, 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 the leader there, you don't have to accuse him of taking funds, you just have to disagree with him. And he's had some of his top level men, even his own family, executed because he just, they disagreed with him as a leader and just voiced that in a very casual way. So. You know what that can do in your life? Now, if you were part of his administration, what would that do? Would you feel real secure? I don't think you would. I wouldn't. I think it would create lots of stress in your life if that was happening uh, in the administration that I was serving in. So I'm thankful that we don't have leaders like that here in our country. What about you? I'm thankful we serve in a place that's the land of the free and we can worship in a, in a very special way. There's something that uh, is important, I think, for us to understand tonight, and it really deals with stress, and it's sort of a continuation from what Jim was talking about, and it's all about Jesus once again. There's something that you're going to find is a theme that we talk about here night by night, and it's sort of like sometimes when I go and I'm about ready to preach in church, they'll say, Pastor, what are you going to preach on? And my response is, well, Jesus is going to be in there. <laughs> Why? Because I'm a gospel preacher. And so as we look at the book of Revelation, if the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus, what should we be preaching on? We should be preaching about Jesus and how Jesus wants us to live in the light of what he is disclosing for us to understand in that book of Revelation. So I want to talk to you tonight about Revelation's Peacemaker. A number of years ago, there was a prestigious medical university and, and they did some testing about stress and how much stress could we actually take as human beings. How much could we handle in our lives? How much of a heavy burden was it possible for us to deal with? How much could we carry? How much anxiety could we live with without snapping like this woman did that shot her two children and then took her own life? What about worry and tension? What kind of a role do they play in our lives? How much pressure can we take without literally breaking and doing something that is just awful and irreversible? And so they decided they were going to do their experiments with some little lambs. They wanted to see how lambs related to stress because they figured that if they learned about little lambs, there might be some applications to learn about how humans could relate to stress. And so they performed this test. They took a lamb and they put this little lamb in a pen. The lamb could not observe anything outside the pen, but they made it where they could observe everything within the pen. They could look in and see exactly what the lamb was doing. And around that pen, they took feeding stations, 14 of them, and placed them all around the perimeter of that pen. And they could let the lamb go to one feeding station and eat and go to another part of the, to the, to the uh, area to another feeding station and eat and they could do that over and over and over again and then they did something different they hooked up some electrodes to those feeding stations and when the little lamb would go to one feeding station and begin to eat you know what they did they shot that little lamb and that little lamb you know what his reaction was why it, it ran away and it just anxiously began to jump and it ran to another feeding station and it started eating at that feeding station and when it began eating at that station, you know what they did? Come on. You can figure it out. They shocked it again. And they shocked it over and over and over again. It nervously began to twitch and bolt. And it ran from station to station and station. And at every station, they shocked that little lamb. That little lamb ran to the center of that pen. And it began to shake violently. It had a nervous breakdown. It was so anxious. The little lamb laid there on the ground and began to twitch at the shake and that little lamb had a heart attack and it died right there in the center of that pit. Then the researchers did something else. They took the lamb's twin brother and they put that lamb in the pen as well. But this time they put the mother in there with that little lamb's twin brother. Same feeding station, same shocking, same everything could take place. Everything was exactly as it was. And they turned it loose at the pit. And that little lamb went over to a feeding station and began to eat. And 
you know what they did? They shot that lamb. But the little lamb didn't run from that feeding station. It looked up and it turned to its mother and said, Bah! And its mother looked at the little lamb and said, Bah! And then do you know what the little lamb did? It turned around and began eating out of the same feeding station once again. Again, they shocked the lamb. The lamb did the same thing. It turned to its mother and began to bat. And mother began to speak to it and began to bat. And then they shocked it again. And the lamb did the same thing, but this time it ran over to its mother. And its little mother kind of nuzzled it. And it looked at it. And it spoke a little, a little lamb talk. It said, bah. and the little lamb, bah, bah. I don't speak very good lamb language, do I? Uh -uh. <laughs> and here's where the research kind of breaks down because they didn't know what the mother lamb was speaking to the baby lamb or the baby lamb was talking to the mother lamb because they don't know sheep talk. But then the little dead lamb did something extraordinary. It turned and went right back to the same feeding station that it had been shot over and over and over again. It did not run around to any of those other feeding stations, but it did not have a nervous breakdown and die. What made the difference? What, what do you think happened that made a difference for that little lamb and it was able to cope with the stress that it was experiencing? Why did it go back and keep eating from that same feeding station after it was shot over and over and over again? What made the difference? Everything was the same except for one thing. The mama lamb was in the pen with the baby. The baby lamb had someone there that it could run to, someone there that could comfort it, someone there that could give it encouragement, someone there to help bear the burden that it was experiencing. You know, I think about our own lives. We need someone that we can run to to carry our burden as well. Though. We need someone when, when the enemy of life, the one that was in heaven that was cast out, when the enemy of life begins to shock us with the sin of this life and put heavy burdens upon us, we need someone that we can run to. Someone that will carry our burden. Someone that will lift our spirits. Someone that won't speak lamb talk to our ears, but will speak words of love to our ears and words of comfort and words of peace and words of hope. And that person is Jesus Christ. And so the question comes to us, how do we handle the guilt in our lives? When we're filled with condemnation, how do we handle worry and anxiety? Who indeed can give us that security, my friends? The question comes to us, and, it, and we, most of us, a lot of us face it every single day. Do you realize that I venture to say that each person in this place tonight is experiencing some kind of pain in your life right now? Some kind of pain. Some kind of pain. How do you deal with that pain? When the storms of life begin to rage all around you, it's about to capsize your little ship. What are you going to do? In the trauma of life, is there a place of security that we can run to? Can we live with hope in this life that we face today? I want to tell you tonight unequivocally, yes, you can live with hope. The book of Revelation describes for us Jesus Christ in all of his splendor, in all of his beauty. And he describes for us in a very special way, in an unusual way. In Revelation 1 to Revelation 22, there is a hero in this book. And his name is Jesus Christ. The beginning and the end. The Alpha and the Omega. The book of Revelation has many symbols to describe Jesus. Many, many, many. But the symbol of a dying lamb is the most prominent and it is the most precious symbol that there is. It is found more times than any other symbol in the book of Revelation. A dying lamb. 27 times Jesus describes himself as a lamb in the book of Revelation. 5 and 6 puts it this way. I looked and beheld in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as though it had been slain. A bloody lamb. Could you imagine that? A bloody lamb up in heaven. And thousands of created beings are around that throne and they're worshiping this lamb. What does it mean? It means one thing for certain. It means that all of heaven worships the Christ who died, the lamb that was slain. 
slain from the foundation of this world, slain before the Garden of Eden, slain in a promise that was to come, that he would in fact be our Redeemer. Celestial beings sing praises to this God. Revelation 12, 11 says this, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. Before human race, before we ever sin, God in his infinite wisdom, he put a plan in place, a plan in operation for a purpose, my friend. Why did God do that? Because in God's infinite love, in his infinite understanding, in his infinite knowledge about what was going to happen in the future, heaven was prepared for the possibility of sin. It's that choice that we make. Heaven was prepared for the bad choice that Adam made in the Garden of Eden. Revelation 13 and verse 8 puts it like this. The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world in the distant ages of eternity past, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they came and devised a plan to save the fallen humanity before humanity ever fell. Revelation talks about a great feast when our Lord himself will usher us into heaven and we're escorted to this, to this marriage supper of the Lamb. I want to be at that supper, what about you? Amen. Amen. That's a commitment I want to make in my life and I want to trust that Jesus Christ is going to bring that to fruition just as he promised he would. Why? Because I can trust Him. You know, salvation is all about trust. Do we trust God or not trust God? Do we believe His Word or do we not believe His Word? In Revelation, there is this dragon-like beast, and this dragon-like beast attacks the Lamb. It's depicted in many, many, many ways in the book of Revelation. It's a beast with seven heads and ten horns. It's a fierce beast. It's an awesome beast. And it rises up out of the sea. And you know what it does? It makes war with the land. It's pictured as a woman riding on a scarlet horse. It's a great power, a citadel of, of Satan called Babylon. And that citadel attacks the lamb. But the lamb triumphs over the dragon. Somebody ought to say hallelujah tonight. Amen. The lamb triumphs over the dragon. The lamb defeats the dragon. It defeats the beast with seven heads and ten horns. It triumphs over all false religions that there is in the world today. And they're symbolized by the woman riding on that scarlet covered beast, colored beast with a wine cup in her hand. The lamb becomes victorious over fallen Babylon. That's good news tonight, my friend. In the book of Revelation, the lamb wins. I'm glad that the lamb wins. I'm glad about that. What about you tonight? Amen. I want to be on the winning team. Anybody here like to lose? You play a game and you just say, you know, I don't want to win. I'm just going to, I'm going to play to lose. Well, you know, there's a surefire way to lose in this life if you choose not to be on the Lamb's team with the Lamb as your head. That's how you lose. Because all other, all other methods are no good because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Through me. Amen. And so it's through this Lamb, my friends, that we come to Christ. I'm glad that Satan loses. You know, it's sort of like, you know, they, 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 you read some of the old westerns and the guy, you know, the guy says, well, I'm not really unhappy. It doesn't really stop me. You know, it's at the beginning of the book. And they say, why are you smiling? All this terrible stuff's going on. He says, I read the last book. I read the last chapter. We know the last chapter, don't we? So we can go through all of this mess and we can say, hey, wait a minute. I've read the last chapter. I know who wins. I want to be on God's side. What about you? Amen. Revelation 17, 4 says, the lamb will make, the, these will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will do what? The lamb will overcome them. If we're on the lamb side, we're on the winning side. I'm glad about that. Tonight. Why? Because the Bible says, for he is king of kings and lord of lords. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. Why would God choose something as innocent as a little lamb? To represent his son. Have you ever thought about that? Why would God do that? There's so many other animals that we might think that would represent the king of kings and lord of lords. But God has chosen a little lamb, an innocent little lamb, to represent his son Jesus. Well, we've got to go back to trace some symbolism back in time. 
Back to look at what a lamb represents in the Bible, my friends. We have to see how this lamb, this symbolic lamb, reaches out and touches our lives today because it can't just be about 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago. It has to be about today, doesn't it? It has to apply to us today. There has to be some meaning in this lamb's life for us today. Otherwise, there's no purpose for the lamb. And so we need to go back in time to see how this will actually touch us and move us. How does this understanding of this little lamb, how does it free us from this burden of guilt that we face in our life? How does it liberate us from not just the, the guilt and penalty of our sins, but how does it liberate us from the power of sin in our lives? Because God is calling for us to be victorious in Christ. Don't you know that tonight? And through this lamb, God assures us of this magnificent gift of eternal life. He says, I want you to live forever, and I want you to live in eternity with me. Amen. With me. And so we've got to go back once again to the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve sinned, God said to them, you must bring a sacrifice. It is only by the shedding of blood that your sins can be forgiven. And you know what they did? They fashioned themselves little uh, clothing out of some kind of meat. And they hid from God. But God said, you must bring a sacrifice so your sins can be forgiven. Moses in the Old Testament, kind of in the book of Leviticus, he says it like this. He says, for in the blood, it is in the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why the blood? Because blood represents life. Leviticus, the first part, 1711, says this. For the, for the life is in the flesh in the, of the blood. And so the wages of sin is death, and it's by the shedding of blood, the Bible says, the shedding of blood, and this blood represents the divine Son of God pouring out His life on Calvary for you and for me. Yep. And so, following God's instructions, did you imagine Adam bringing, you know, it was God that slain the first animal, and fashioned after the fashion from those animal clothing of skin and be covered Adam and Eve. And then he instructed Adam to bring sacrifices after that. So he tells him to bring this pure spotless lamb. And you know what Adam had to do? He had to take his knife and he had to put it to the throat of that innocent little lamb and he had to watch the blood drip slowly to the ground. That sounds gruesome, doesn't it? Why would God do that? Because God wanted Adam and Eve to understand the horrificness of sin that had come in their life. Mm -hmm. What that had brought, not just upon Adam and Eve, but what it had brought to all of God's creation. That little lamb was created perfect. It was innocent. But Adam had to take his life because they made a choice to disobey God. And the wages of that choice was sin, and the wages of that sin was death. And so it was designed to break the heart of the ones who had to bring the sacrifice. The lamb was a foreshadow. It pointed forward to the death of Jesus Christ himself. Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin is what? It is death, my friend. And so either Adam had to die, or there had to have a substitute. Another substitute had to be found to take the place of Adam and Eve there in the garden. And so throughout the Old Testament, God instructed them. He instructed them to bring sacrifices. He instructed them to, to build a tabernacle. And those sacrifices were to represent the one supreme sacrifice of the one supreme Lamb of God that was going to give His life as a ransom for many. And that's the person of Jesus Christ. And so they had to build this tabernacle in the Old Testament. And they were instructed to bring their sacrifices morning and evening. Every day the animals were slain in that tabernacle. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Every day. Imagine. What did that mean when they brought a lamb into that sanctuary? Into that tabernacle? What was going on there? Imagine, if you will, in your mind. What if you were alive and you were to witness uh, an altercation between your two neighbors?
Perhaps we'll call him Josiah. Perhaps Josiah gets up and he's angry with his neighbor and he goes over there and they're at the back, they're at the back of their property and they're talking back and forth. And Josiah is so upset that he, he strikes his neighbor in the face and he knocks him to the ground and he bloodies his eye and he bloodies his nose. And he leaves and goes off to work that day. But throughout the day, he begins to be convicted of his sin. And he goes home that night and he apologizes to his neighbor. But Josiah still must do something to make atonement, to make sacrifice for that sin. So the next morning, Josiah gets up and he takes a pure, spotless lamb. And he makes his way to the sanctuary. And he takes that lamb and he presents it to the priest. And then the priest gives him the knife, and Josiah has to slay that lamb. He puts the throat to the lamb's throat, and he slits his throat, and it, he, he feels the lamb twitch and jerk as the blood streams down, and they, they catch the blood. And the priest does something special with that blood, and they put that lamb on the sacrifice, and it's, con it's consumed. And the priest takes the blood, and and he sprinkles it before the veil of the most holy place that contained the ark with God's commandments inside. What was going on there, my friends, as Josiah kneeled and he took the life of that little lamb? Symbolically, what was taking place was his guilt was symbolically being transferred transferred to, the, to that little innocent lamb. And then from that innocent lamb, after it was slain with the blood, symbolically that sin was taken into the sanctuary and it was sprinkled before the veil and transferred there. And then Josiah could leave. He could leave there free of his guilt, free of his anxiety. Free to know that what he had committed had been taken care of through the sacrifice of that little lamb. So the question comes today, what do we do? What happens with our sins? What about the Lamb of God? What does he do for us? Leviticus puts it like this. He says, it shall be when he is guilty in any one of these matters that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin, which he has committed. So when Josiah brought it and transferred that guilt, don't you think that he had a sense of relief? He must have felt good that he had been forgiven. But I suspect that he had some sorrow for the lamb that was slain. What do you think? Because he had caused that animal to lose its life. So, what happens today? What is it that God wants us to understand from this little sandbox illustration that Jesus Christ has done for us? He wants us to understand that there are some steps to forgiveness that we must get in our own life as well. First of all, you have to acknowledge your own guilt. Does that make sense? We have to realize that, that we, in fact, need to be forgiven. Josiah had to understand that he, in fact, had done something wrong. He had wronged his neighbor. He had lost his temper, and he had acted out. And so, the steps to forgiveness are to acknowledge our guilt. Then he had to confess his sin over that little lamb. And then he accepted the forgiveness that was promised to him if he confessed his sin. And then they believed God for what he had promised. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Why do we make it so complicated today? What's happening with us? What's going on with us? The Old Testament sacrifices pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice. And it seems like today we get a little bit confused in how to handle the guilt that lies before us. A preacher was visiting somebody that was coming to his church, and it was a lady, and, and she was very, very upset. So as he visited with her, she began to tell him that there's something that she had done many, many years ago that was 
bothering her. She couldn't get victory over it. She just worried her and worried her and worried her. She says, Pastor, I've done something terrible and I just can't get over it. She said, at one point in my life, I had an affair and that affair, that affair resulted in a child and an abortion. 17 years ago, I had my little baby aboard. And the burden of that guilt is just weighing me down. I don't know what to do with it. It has crushed my spirit. It has, it has taken the joy literally out of my life. What can I do with that? I know what I did 17 years ago. It was tragically wrong. But, but I can't bring that little baby back. What can I do? And the pastor looked at her. She said, Pastor, it's breaking my heart. And as he looked at her, he responded to her very gently. He said, you know what? If we lived in the Old Testament times, you know what you would have done? You would have brought a lamb. And then you would have taken the life of that little lamb. You would have confessed your sins over that little lamb. And your sins would have been transferred to that lamb. And the lamb would die for you symbolically. But the problem is, the problem is that we don't live in the Old Testament times and, and you don't have a lamb. But there is a lamb. He is the Savior of the world. And if you will confess your sin to him, if we'll kneel down here today and you'll confess your sin to Him, your, your sin will be forgiven and that burden will be rolled off of your shoulders. And she did. And she left there a woman in relief. Our guilt can be wiped clean because of what the Lamb has done for us. Some will say, preacher, that's pretty easy. It is. It's just not cheap. There's a difference. It's the most expensive sacrifice that has ever been given. And so he calls us to come to him. He says, if you confess your sins, what is he? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Every lamb sacrifice did one thing, my friends, it pointed forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. All of those Old Testament believers, they look forward to Christ's sacrifice. And all of us New Testament believers, we look back to Christ's sacrifice. They converge in one place because it's by faith that we receive what Jesus has done for us. And I want to say to you tonight, my friends, don't make it harder than it is. Don't struggle with things when you don't need to struggle with that. Jesus says to cast your burden upon him. Come to him. And he will give you rest. The Lamb of the Old Testament, the Lamb of God, it is he who takes away the sins of the world. And so to be free from the guilt that we experience in our life, we must first of all acknowledge that guilt. We must understand that that, that we would never be free from guilt unless we acknowledge what we have done. We can't bring a lamb because that, that system is over, but we look for the lamb who died for us. It's only as we say, God, I understand that I have sinned. I understand that I've lost my temper. I understand that I have gotten angry. And I want you to forgive me. I've been filled with lust. I have been dishonest. I have told untruths. I have gossip. I have created division in the church. It's only as we recognize what we have done and come to God and say, God, please forgive me. That that burden of guilt will be taken from you. And if we do, the good news is that it shall be taken from you. Amen? Amen. So we've got to be honest with who we are. The Bible puts it like this. For the wages of sin is what? Death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm thankful for the promise of God tonight. Amen. Oh, what a God we serve. I don't want to bear my guilt. Do you want to bear your guilt? That's an expensive <laughs> proposition for us, one that we cannot pay for. But if I come, my guilt is rolled away. I'm glad that my burden can be rolled out of my life tonight.
Christ died to bear that burden on the cross of Calvary. He died the death that I deserve so I can live the life that he, that he deserved to live. I'm thankful for that, aren't you tonight? Amen. God wants us to live a great and grand and forgiven life. He went to the grave so I could worship him on his throne. Praise Jesus for that tonight. He wore a crown of thorns so, so I could wear a crown of glory in heaven. What a God we serve, my friends. What happened that day was far more than the blood of animals that was being shed in the Old Testament. No, no, my friends. Hebrews puts it like this. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered him without spot to God? What shall he do to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? Wow. What a promise that is. Your conscience can be cleansed. You know what fear does? Fear creates anxiety. And guilt creates anxiety. But God has something for us. He says that he came to give us life and he wants that life to be abundant in us. I want to live the abundant life. What about you tonight? So all we have to do is come to God and say, God, I know I have failed. I know I have let you down. And God will take that guilt and he has washed it away. There's only one who can take our guilt and wash it away and offer forgive to us. And that is Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Sometimes, sometimes we make some excuses, don't we? Sometimes we don't like to admit that what we have done is in reality a sin. Sometimes we like to say, well, you know, it, it, it's not really my fault. I, 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 maybe you heard about the company who was in negotiations. Uh, they were having some heated negotiations with their labor union, and the CEO of the company was there at the table with the with the with the union and the rest of his staff, and they were talking back and forth. And the one administrator says, "You know what? We can't continue giving these uh, these benefits because our employees are abusing them." We give them sick leave privileges and, and, and they just disregard them and take those sick days to do whatever they want to do. It's too much. We have to stop because they're not being honest with what they're doing. They were arguing one way and the union came back and says, no, no, you've got to give more privileges. You've got to give more privileges. You've got to give more benefits. You've got to give more sick days. And so the tense, the negotiations got tense and the and the CEO, he was so angry, he said, I'll prove to you that the employees are abusing their privileges. And so he stood up and he held up the morning newspaper and it says, here's one of our employees winning a golf tournament yesterday and he called in sick. And the headline read, they were describing his excellent golf score. And the union negotiator was silent for a few moments and he looked at the CEO and he said, wow. Imagine what kind of score he would have had if he wasn't sick. <laughs> Sometimes we just make excuses. No, we have to be honest with ourselves, my friends. Sometimes we are dishonest. Excuses will not do. Excuses won't cut it. Sometimes we say, you know, I sinned because my mother sinned. I sinned because my grandmother did this, or my grandfather did that, or my, or my father did that. And it goes on and on and on. My father lost his temper. You know, he's a hot-tempered Italian. My mother lost her temper. She's a hot-tempered Irish. And so we just go on and on and on with, with all of these, um, uh, well, how should I say that, uh, politically incorrect statements to justify what we have done. Is that really a reason? For those of us who claim to be born again Christians in the body of Christ, it seems to me like I read the Bible where it says, Behold, I make all things new. It seems to me like when I come to Jesus, Jesus takes the old man and does something with that old man, makes us into a new man. Isn't that right? Amen. So I can't, I can't blame what my ancestors did on what I'm doing today. Because if I'm in Christ, I am a new creation. I'm a new creature. If we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we have to believe that God can surely recreate us. Isn't that right? Amen. So we have to be honest, my friends. We have to be able to say, listen, I am who I am 
It doesn't matter who my grandparents were or who my ancestors were. Sometimes we think that what we've done in our lives, that good works are going to solve those issues. You know, I've done so many terrible things that I decided I'm going to go to church and I'm going to make all things right. And as we go to church, we say, well, I'm going to give offerings and I'm going to help the poor and I'm going to do all these things that are ministry and I'm going to have ministries of compassion and I'm going to interact and I'm going to make up for all the bad things we've done. But you know what? You can't make up for every bad thing you've done. Because the Bible <coughs> has some counsel for us. There's only one way that you can be made clean, that you can be free from your guilt. And it's not by the good things you've done because God's not running a ledger. He's not keeping count of how many good things you've done and how many bad things you've done. That's not going to take away our guilt. Sometimes we deny who we are. I'm thankful that we serve God who has something special to say to us. There's a song that says, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, do what? Lose all their guilty states. Second Corinthians says, for he that is God made him that is Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a promise. God has declared us to be righteous. Aren't you happy about that tonight? Amen. Why? Because he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Sometimes we begin to think that, that we are good and that we deserve what God is giving. But God says there is none righteous. No, not one. None of us. There is no amount of good people so there is only one way, and that's to come to Jesus and allow him to wash us and make us clean again. Yeah. You know, I think back in my own life. I, uh, I was a product of the 60s. Anybody here raised in the 60s? Let me see your hands. Don't be liars now. <laughs> you know where the liars are. They're not inside the city. They're outside the city. So, so <laughs> be careful. Be careful when you don't raise your hands. So I was a product of the 60s, and I, I, was born in, I was born in Florida, but my parents moved to California when I was about four, and, and I lived in the Central Valley out there, and, and my grandpa had a little, a, little, a little ranch, they called it, but it was more of a little dirt farm. Um, the, the ranch was, sounds really good. It was 20 acres, and we didn't have any money. We lived in a little, uh, we lived in the trailer. You know, they call them mobile homes today, but modular houses, all kind of names. Nothing wrong with that, but I didn't live in a mobile home nor a modular home. I lived in a trailer. And it was eight feet wide and 32 feet long. I have a fifth wheel that I own today that's bigger than the trailer I grew up in. It's got three slide outs. 34 feet and three slides. If I'd have had that when I was a kid, I, thought, I would have thought I lived in a mansion. There were five of us lived in that little trailer. My mother and father lived in a little, in a little back bedroom on a three-quarter bed. My brother and I, it was a little hallway that slipped by, and the beds were here. There was a bed, and there was a bunk bed. My sister slept in the bunk bed, and my brother and I slept together in the same bed, and it was a little, I don't even think it was a three-quarter bed. It was like, I mean, it was small. My brother was eight years older than I, and I, I just visited with him last week, and he was telling me that I knocked him out of bed. I said, look, you're eight years older than me. I was a little tiny kid. I said, I remember you plastered up against the wall while you sprawled out. So there we were in that little trailer. And, and you know, life, you know, we didn't have any money, but you know what? I never went to bed hungry. And I had a pretty happy life. But I determined something when I was young, and that was I did not want to be poor. And so my goal in life was to accumulate wealth. And I didn't tell anybody that, but that's just what I decided I was going to do. Now, my father, my father was a kind, loving father. But my father kind of liked to take a drink. And it wasn't just every now and again. He was what we would call today an alcoholic. Now, my mother would be hesitant to call him an alcoholic, but you got to be honest. 
with whom he's got. And so he was an alcoholic. I can remember at 12 years old, I learned to drive when I was about 10 in a farm truck. And then about when I was 12, I can remember driving around the country roads with my dad. I was driving and my dad would kind of drink a beer and we'd just drive around and have a good time together. That was my life. And then when I got in high school and I began to play sports, my father came to some uh, sporting events and he was in a non-sober condition and it kind of embarrassed me. And, and so, uh, you know, I began to be sort of an angry young boy. And I began to do all those things that angry young boys do, you know, you get into rebellion. And, and so at a very early age, you know what I began to do? I began to mimic my father. So I began to drink when I was about 13. And I did things that, you know, we all should do. So we're going to get past that. So when I'm 18, um, I moved back to Florida. And I had a job back there, and I met a young girl. And I fell in love. Uh, met her in, I can't remember, I think I went back to Florida at the end of March. And uh, the 25th of July. We got married. This July 25th is going to be 47 years. So, so God took me 3,000 miles so I could find a, a good woman. And I didn't know what he was actually doing. And I remember telling her when I proposed to her, I said, hey, listen, I'm going to accumulate wealth. I'm going to be wealthy. If you want to, if you want to have some wealth, just hit your little wagon to my little wagon, and we're going to go. <laughs> That's what I did. But I was still angry and, you know, I still was getting conflicts and lots of things were going on in my life. And, and I was sort of out of control. I, I would get so angry that, I, you know, they talk about blacking out when you get so mad before you get into a fight. I would kind of go black on you, you know. I would not know what's there. I could see, but I really didn't see. I worked for a car dealer. I sold new car, used cars. There I said it. I was a used car salesman. And uh, I was 24 years old. And we had a young boy working at that dealership who was 18, about to graduate from high school. And he was a good kid. And he and I got to be really good friends. And I had sold him uh, a boat that I had purchased. He wanted a, he wanted a speed boat. I had a little 18-foot uh, 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 needle nose ski boat that ran about 80 miles an hour, pulled two skiers about 70. He said, I want that boat. I said, you know, for the right price, it can't be yours. And so he bought my boat. And he was going to marry his high school sweetheart. They were going to graduate from high school and they were going to get married. And she was the daughter of a Baptist preacher. They were planning their wedding. They left their home, his parents' home, at 10 o'clock one night. Drove down the road about two miles, and they were crossing the railroad crossing. The train came and struck their car and killed them both. And I tell you, it rocked my world. Up until that point, I had never, I wasn't raised in a home, you know, where, where God was talked about. I, my mother loved God, but, you know, I was kind of like my dad. And so I didn't, I did not know about God. I didn't know about Jesus. So I, I just didn't know anything. I never gave God a thought. I wasn't an atheist. I was kind of a person that said, I know there's a God, but I don't think he cares about me. And what's the difference anyway? So when this death came to my friend, I was just rocked. And I was puzzled. And I thought, why did he die? Why did Greg die? Because he's a good kid. I'm not such a good guy. And I was still living. That didn't make sense to me at all. I had never been to a funeral in my life. And I decided I wasn't going to go to Greg's funeral. And so the day the funeral came, I, was, I got in my car and I went to lunch and I drove around and all of a sudden I found myself, this is a true story, I found myself in the parking lot of the funeral home and don't know how I got there. But I'm just sitting in the car. And I'm looking and I said, there's the funeral home. I thought, well, maybe I better go in. Now, you know what it's like when two teenage kids get killed? The place is packed. You can't hardly get in the funeral home. I walked in the door. I slid past the people that were standing in the hallway, and there was a seat on the back row. I sat down. 
And I heard the preacher begin to talk about Greg in his life. And he began to talk about this man named Jesus. This man named Jesus who could forgive us of all the wrong things we had done in our lives and would accept us just like we are. And he would wash us and forgive us and make us new. And he said these words. He said, I'm telling you this today because there's somebody here that's hearing this for the first time in their life. <laughs> and as I heard that, I knew he didn't know me, but I knew he was talking about me. He said, Greg didn't die in vain. There's somebody here today that's going to know Jesus and they're going to accept Jesus and they're going to live for eternity because Greg died and they're hearing about Christ for the first time. Amen. And I knew that he was speaking to me. At the end of that funeral, they started at the back for people to come and pay their last respects and they came down the aisle. And I stood in front of that coffin and I looked into his face, his cold, dead face. And I knew, I knew that I needed to accept Jesus. I did. I got baptized a few weeks later in the Baptist church. Hallelujah for the Baptist. I said, hallelujah for the Baptist. Amen. I love my Baptist brothers and sisters. And I experienced grace. Grace. God's grace like you cannot believe. And you know what it did for me? It changed my life. This God that I never knew until that day came in to my life. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you'll open that door, guess what he'll do? He'll come in. And he'll sup with you. He'll eat with you. He'll drink with you. He'll live in you. And I thought to myself, this is wonderful. I'm really living large. A couple weeks later, I'm at the car dealer. Can I come down? Come down here. I'm at the car dealer. And this guy comes up in front of the used car lot. And he begins to honk his horn. Right? He begins to pound on his horn. He has his window down about that far. And, and all of a sudden, he begins to yell out of his window, and, I, and none of the other salesmen are going to go out and talk to him. I didn't sell the guy a car, but he was angry at something. And I thought, well, somebody needs to go talk to him. And so I opened the door of the office, and I stepped down the steps, and as I stepped down the steps, suddenly his eyes caught my eyes, and he took all his hatred and anger and animosity, he began to curse at me and call me all kinds of foul names. Now, I'm a newborn Christian. Now, I know what to do about that. Not in the new man, but in the old man. And so, you know, the new man hasn't been in there very long, and the old man's been in there 24 years. So now what's going to happen? So the old man takes over. I run to his car, I stick my hand through his window, and I'm about to grab him by his throat to drag him out and to beat him to a pulp. And while my hand is going through the window, I said, God, if you're real, you've got to do something about this. And immediately, my hand came out of his car. I stood before him as calm as you can imagine. And I said, sir, it might be good if you come back at another time. <laughs> I got my turned around, 
What did the officer say? Yeah. I knew. I knew that I served a powerful God. Because if he can get this angry young boy's temper under control, this God can do anything. This God can transform my life beyond that. If he can control that, then I've served him from then on. Because he's a powerful God. He's a real God. So I don't know what's going on in your life today. I don't know what God needs to speak to in your life today, but I want to tell you the God that transformed me will transform you. I don't know what trouble and trials and what character defect you might have in your life, but whatever it is, if you surrender it to God and confess your sin, He's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all of that mess in your life. He will. Pray with me. Father in heaven. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. We know that he's living whatever men will say. Oh Jesus. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for while we were yet sinners, you died for us, the ungodly, that we might live for eternity with you because we trust you and we love you because you first loved us. Father, I pray that your spirit would move over us right now and that you'd search our hearts and if there's someone in this place tonight Someone who doesn't know Christ. Someone who has wandered in here. Someone who is searching. Someone like me who found themselves in this parking lot and didn't know why. But they've come in here and they've heard about you. Or maybe they've been attending, but, but they've never really committed their life to you. Father, I pray that if there's someone here in this house of God tonight, that, that you would impress them and touch them and they'd surrender their life to you. So if that's your desire, if you've never made a commitment to Jesus, but you want to commit tonight, I invite you to raise your hand right where you are. Is there one? Is there one? Maybe there's something happening in your life. Maybe you've been struggling and struggling and asking forgiveness and you've been repeating the same sin over and over and over again. And you wonder, God, are you real? God, you've got to do something about this if you are a real God. And tonight, you want to lay that character challenge before him one more time. And to step out in faith and say, God, do for me what I cannot do for myself. I run the white flag up. I surrender to you, your son. I invite the Holy Spirit to come and take charge of my life. If that's your desire, slip your hand up wherever you are. Yes, yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you do. We look forward to eternity, to a life with you. In Jesus' name, amen.